Good morning and welcome to the SCADI webinar on how products trade and how this trading would have been affected during lockdown. My name is Claire Ostridge and I'm the business manager for SCADI. We'll be joined today by Damien Taylor, who is our director of training and development, and he'll be hosting the webinar and talking about equities and ETFs. The webinar will be recorded and there will be um, question and answers at the end, so please subscribe to the button below. And now, Damien, if you're ready, we'll start the uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So, yes, um, here we are today. We're going to talk about um, equities and ETFs, two products that I have traded in, in, in my past guise. Uh, and we're going to look at really how these products trade generally within a bank and then how this trading would have changed and how it would have been affected um, during lockdown. And really looking at it from more from a sort of control uh, perspective about what uh, shortcuts might have been taken, what um, temporary measures might have been put in place that then need to be go back and checked over to make sure that the um, financial institution is, is covered. Um, I'm just going to give a bit of a quick rundown about SCADI. Um, we were founded eight years ago uh, and we, uh, we've taken the sort of view that we can take people that have worked in front office roles as traders or structurers or head of desks and then using that sort of subject matter expertise uh, plug that back into the second and third line of defense at financial institutions. Um, so we have done a lot of investigations work for financial institution, institutions and also helped out uh, internal audit departments and compliance departments from a sort of a, a, a having worked at the at the, at the coal face at the, at the cutting edge taking that sort of front office knowledge and then and then plugging it back through. Um, we've also done some work for law firms. Obviously, in our working careers, we've come across many experts in the field, uh, and we help law firms subject, uh, on subject matter expertise for uh, expert witness cases that they might come across. So, whereby uh, people might have been missold a product, or there might have been some structured derivative uh, a contract entered into by, to by two parties, we can find experts that ha have dealt in these areas. To, to aid um, these, legal, these legal firms. Um, so as, as I said at the beginning, we're gonna to talk today about equities and ETFs. Um, it's sort of on paper, these things might, may seem relatively simplistic products and in the general scheme or the hierarchy of uh, financial securities, they're certainly at the easier end, but actually the mechanics of how they trade within a financial institution are a bit more complicated than it would first appear from what you would see on CNBC or what you might read in a book uh, about how these things trade. So uh, I've traded these things for nearly 20 years in my career uh, and hopefully might have some insights uh, into, into how they trade and, uh, and also what might have been going on in the last six months or so uh, as, as a lot of people have been in lockdown. Um, this is just a bit about me. Um, prior to joining SCADI, I started my career in the city as an analyst. Uh, covering uh, what are known as closed-end funds, of which investment trusts are a subset. Uh, I've traded on both a uh, proprietary and agency basis. On an agency basis, I'd be trading, trading on behalf of the, the clients of the firm, looking just to, uh, well, take the, they'd be given advice by sales, our, our sales traders or salesmen, uh, and then we would then look to execute those, that, those orders on behalf of them, taking commission along the way. Uh, I've also worked as a proprietary trader, which is using the firm's capital to um, to, to to take bets within the market and look to make to make um, to make more money for the firm. Um, also, uh, I've worked on both sides of the fence, I suppose, uh, by, both buy side and sell side. Uh, I've worked as a hedge fund manager. I set up my own fund and have worked at two other funds as senior partners. Uh, on the trading perspective, my own fund was. Uh, uh, and a, a, what's known as a CTA, um, uh, it traded futures uh, on, on an algorithm that I'd written. So I have expertise in futures as well. Um, just here at the bottom, I've got a list of the products I've traded over the years, equities uh, and ETFs, uh, obviously, as we've been talking about these today, but also I've traded futures options, uh, FX, converts, uh, investment trusts many moons ago, uh, and other OTC closed end funds. So moving on to equities. Just from an overview perspective, uh, an equity trades electronically on screen. Uh, the days of the pit trader are long gone. 
uh, and uh, nearly, well, 99% of the trading that occurs in equities now occurs on screens uh, where you can get an electronic order book, which is uh, built up based on time and price priority. Um, and you have very efficient pricing in these things because they trade uh, minute by minute, second by second, even millisecond by millisecond in this high frequency trading world. Um, you can get a very efficient pricing on equity. You, you, at any point of time during the day, you are aware of where that's trading. You can look back historically and see uh, exactly the price something was trading within, well, milliseconds if need be, when you're looking to uh, look historically at, at where things have traded. Uh, it's very easy to do compared to, let's say, a bond, which might only trade uh, some of the liquid ones once a month or so. So the, the actual, the, the, there's no... There's no pricing mechanism for where that might have traded in between those two prints. If, even if it didn't trade, uh, there it should have. You know, the the, the price may have, may have varied, but only uh, only when a trade takes place would you, would a print be recorded. Um, equities, as not everyone will know, don't just trade on one exchange. So, for instance, uh, uh, Vodafone in the UK doesn't just trade on the London Stock Exchange. There are multiple exchanges that have sprung up, especially post uh, the Mifid One uh, regulations. Uh, a lot of uh, alternative trading venues were set up after this, after that re um, regulation. And uh, so a lot of uh, trading that occurs in, for instance, in Vodafone won't just occur on that London Stock Exchange main venue. Uh, it, will, it will trade across ChiX, across BATS, et cetera, et cetera, all these other venues that have been set up in the, in the preceding years. Uh, large volumes obviously now driven by algorithms uh, and by high frequency trading. Um, so the, the, if you looked at a trading floor today compared with 20 years ago, there are very, uh, there are a lot less traders than they were. A lot of, a lot of the trading has been automated. Uh, a lot of large orders can now be input into algorithms, uh, which can interestingly bring its own issues, but, uh, it is, it's not been good for, for traders generally over the last 20 years or so. Uh, and a lot have moved on to, onto other careers. Um, alongside the trading venues that are used, uh, there are various platforms out there that are used to indicate uh, flows that, that uh, institutions might do, uh, known as IOIs or indications of interest. And what institutions will do to attempt to hook business on people, they will advertise that they might be a buyer or seller in, the, in an individual name, or that they just might advertise that they've traded volume in it in the hope that uh, they might uh, entice other, other market participants to come to them to trade. Uh, moving on, here we can see a, a standard um, equity uh, order book uh, for Vodafone, as we've been talking about that stock so far. Uh, this was a screenshot kindly taken by a friend of mine uh, with Bloomberg about two weeks ago. I'm not sure where Vodafone is trading these days. I think it's a bit lower than that. But anyway, here is a, here's a good sort of summary of what uh, an order book would look like. Um, we can see here on the left side of your screen are all the, the bids in the stock. So we can see that the, the, the maximum bid price at the moment is 126.44. And you can see these are reducing uh, as, as the price lowers down here. Um, and here's the volume that, that occurs at each of those price points. So you can see the higher the price, the higher up the book you will go. And the earlier that your order goes in, the higher up the order you will go. So if we look here at the 126.4 level, the order that went in first at 12.02 sits at the top above the orders that came in uh, at, at later times. And here on the other side is the offer side. So uh, this book is currently 126.44 to 126.5. And likewise, on the other side, the book is constructed in the same way. And if you come in as a buyer, you can either decide to cross the spread by the stock there at 126.5, or you might decide that you want to try and get a better price. Obviously, the problem might be that you don't get that price by sitting on the bid side of the book. And if we look here, we've got a time and sales, which is just the most recent prints that have gone through. And more interestingly, down here, uh, down here in the bottom right, hopefully people can see my mouse as I wiggle it around, is the volume distribution. So this is where the volume in this stock has traded throughout the day so far. Uh, and although it's not named here, this uh, orangish piece of the pie down below uh, would be the London Stock Exchange volume. So actually, as you can see in this name, we've only done 33% of the volume, total volume and traded on the day has taken place in London. Uh, we've got uh, 13, 14% or so taking place on turquoise, 10% Chiax, not sure what this is, there's maybe uh, all the others. And XV, which I think is, uh, would be probably more likely to be the crossing network in this name, 
Um, so this is where blocks have been traded in this name and then printed uh, and recorded within that within that um, volume segment. But as you can see, uh, well under half of the volume that has has gone through in Vodafone has uh, has only has traded uh, uh, on the London Stock Exchange. A lot more of the the other venues have taken quite a lot of that that volume as well. Uh, and then we'll look at the mechanics of how an equity actually trades uh, on the floor of a, of, of a uh, institution. And then from that, we can then look at what breaks might have occurred as we've moved into lockdown and as and as floors have been dissipated across across home networks. So generally uh, in a buy side institution like a, a big asset manager or maybe a hedge fund, the salesman from the bank would be talking to a portfolio manager who then might decide to execute an order based off maybe some research they've written or whatever it is. So the order in this case might be to buy 10 million Vodafone, the portfolio manager will speak to his dealer um, who will then uh, push, this, push this order across to the finance institution to a sales trader or maybe this day, in this day and age, in fact, direct to a trader. A lot of this or nearly all of this will now occur. This initial conversation here obviously will have been done on, on the phone, but the minute the order has been generated, it will be input into a system and it will start to travel through uh, from the PM to the dealer to the sales trader or the, or the trader. And then when it arrives at the trader, he has a decision to make uh, as to where or which venue or which uh, method he is gonna use to execute this. So he could either look to use an algorithm, uh, 10 million Vodafone, you could probably trade that over a few hours in the, on the order book, I would guess. So he might decide to place it into an algorithm to look at to trade I don't know, VWAP uh, equivalent over the next three hours, let's say. So he would, the, the, the algorithm would then take that order and slice it based on uh, historic volume profiles in the stock, probably saving a lot of volume. I mean, if I had that order now, for instance, at 10 in the, what are we now, 10, 15 in the morning, I'd probably look to work that over the rest of the day. And a lot of that would actually get pushed into the uh, closing auction that occurs on the London Stock Exchange. And it, as, as it does occur on most European stock exchanges, uh, a lot of the volume tends to get um, pulled into that region. So you might leave sort of 20, 30% of the order to, to, to uncross in that matching at the end of the day. Uh, and then you'd be looking to slice the rest of those, uh, whatever that be, maybe 7 million shares over the next um, few hours. Uh, and the algorithm would be looking at historic volume profiles uh, based off, off that stock and where we sit in the day to try and uh, get the, the most efficient price for the end customer. Uh, the trader might decide to go on risk. He might be requested to go on risk by the portfolio manager, or he might offer the uh, a risk uh, price to the portfolio manager. So in the previous screen, when we looked at, they were 126.5 offered, I think it was. Uh, he might feel that he can offer that size risk at just above the, uh, the offer price. And that risk position would therefore flip to his uh, back book and quite often as these financial institutions actually they run quite large back books that are literally run by by computers almost by algorithms themselves so these these positions are taken on the back book and then hedged out when they get too big either in the futures market I think the hope is that over a course of a day or a week the, the buys and sells will vaguely even each other up so that in fact the, the risk that the bank is taking is not as large as people would expect to allow them to take to price up that risk to an underlying client and that uh, position would then be unwound in the market over uh, maybe maybe in several weeks um, uh, uh, along with all the other positions that would be sitting on that book the trader could decide to speak to other market participants generally um, via idbs into dealer brokers um, uh, who might have been advertising volume in the name, et cetera, et cetera. So they might find that they can get, uh, they could offer 10 million on risk and actually then go and buy 5 million quickly back from an interdealer broker, covering that half of their position while they look to work the rest. Or the trader could, um, you know, nudge his other sales, sales, the rest of his sales force and go and speak to other clients. So see if he can find other clients that might be interested in taking the other side of that trade. They might have some sellers out there that they could, then look to cross up the stock between uh, the two of their clients, take commission on both sides. Uh, in a perfect world, really, they'd be looking to do that trade as much as they can. It's risk-free for them. And as, a, as I just mentioned, they take commission on both sides of the trade. So there's a sort of classic uh, schematic of how an order would flow through the front office of a bank. Obviously, there's nothing here on the back office side of things, 
uh, when the trade is executed, that moves into the back office. We'll have a quick chat about that later on. But this is much more looking at the mechanics in the front office. Uh, and as she used to think about um, uh, generally on the trading floor and also much more importantly in the world we live in today, um, best execution, all banks uh, are bound by a best execution uh, policy. Uh, so this, uh, we were looking at just one order, uh, very easy if you were just doing one order a day. Obviously banks are tr trading multiple thousands of orders on any one day. So, and each, each of those orders has to, has to adhere to best execution. So what would I mean by that? Well, it means for instance, given we've seen this big explosion in trading venues, um, you can't just be looking on the London Stock Exchange for uh, a pricing mechanism. You need to be looking at all the underlying venues as well to try and make sure that you are getting the most efficient price for that client when that order comes in. And when you're trading, for instance, in an algorithm, an algorithm will look to split executions, not just through the London Stock Exchange, but we're looking for liquidity that will be appearing on other venues as well. Excuse me one second. Um, uh, other issues to think about. This is more specifically uh, in the, uh, in the uh, world we live in today, uh, breaks in communication and an audit trail. The great thing about equities being traded on electronic platforms is the audit trail is very, very clear and clean in them because the, uh, as we, if we went back to that schematic we had before, from the minute the order was input by the portfolio manager in his system, there is a timestamp against it. That timestamp can therefore be referenced against the market itself, uh, where the stock was trading at the time. So you can start to already automatically build up a picture of where the stock was trading based off that initial timestamp. Uh, and then as the order flows through the system, either it might be given on risk or it might be put into an algorithm, uh, that order can be tracked and, and the asset managers do this a lot. They have something called transaction cost analysis reports that they get on a daily or weekly basis that will look at how the order has been traded versus where the market was trading at the time. Now, in a, in a sort of post-COVID world where everyone's been forced to go and work from home, the, the chance for breaks in that communication network have increased mo uh, multiple times. For instance, was, would the order be put in initially exactly at the right time or might, maybe the order was phoned through and someone said, oh look, I'll, I'll send you the order on fix in 10 minutes time, or I've got a system problem, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the problem with that is that you haven't got the uh, initial timestamp correct. So all your transaction cost analysis from that order is therefore wrong. Uh, and if people are then starting to buy stock ahead of an order coming in, there's going to be problems. There could be real problems about that. So the, the audit trail uh, and the breaks in communication would have been key in this, in, this, um, in this lockdown period where people have been working from home on less secure networks, on networks that have much slower connection speed rather than where before, whereas before they were sitting in a financial institution on a big uh, big fat uh, network cable with uh, big fat secure cable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, information leakage, this is another key thing and there's been a lot written about this in the press. Uh, first of all, we're talking about just the order itself. Uh, if, an or, if, an, if a client is trying to, let's say, build a position, a big client is trying to build a, build, build a position in a stock, they don't really want that uh, being leaked out to the market. They don't want, um, people to get hold of that order or the, the knowledge that that order is, is taking place before they've executed. The problem for them, for them is if they're looking to buy, let's say Vodafone, 10 million Vodafone, take it. the example we were looking at before, it, they don't want to find that suddenly the stock starts to move away from them and they haven't bought any shares. They're looking to buy 10 million shares. They, they want to buy them at 26 and a half or there or thereabouts. If there's a leakage of that order to the market, uh, maybe via an IDB, maybe via a, a, a Bloomberg chat, whatever it is, to, to a sales force, uh, and other people then start to buy the stock ahead of it, they might find that they're, you know, they're buying Vodafone, they're suddenly buying 10 million Vodafone a percent higher than they meant to. And, you know, that percent is, is a big opportunity cost that they've lost. Um, algorithm misuse. Um, I mentioned or alluded to this earlier. Um, most algorithms obviously have to go through very strict testing before they're released to the market. Uh, famously, back in August 2012, Knight Capital was blown up uh, by a rogue algorithm, as it were. I think it hadn't been tested or it had been tested 
uh, and then released production earlier than it should have been. But anyway, they took a big basket of stocks uh, that were supposed to be executed over a certain number of days or weeks, and they were executed in half an hour, uh, destroying some of these stocks and causing massive, massive losses for the company that it ended up uh, uh, going under and having to be bought out. Front running. Uh, in this day and age of um, people working from home, the information leakage, uh, but like we were talking about earlier, there's a big danger of front running of orders being um, front run by financial institutions, um, which is uh, a, a big problem and, and, um, and easier to police, much easier to police within a financial institution than, than with a disparate workforce working from home. Um, and conflicts of interest um, in financial institutions, especially uh, in, in this, especially you know, the, given all this volatility we've seen uh, and all the, the problems we've seen in certain sectors in the economy, a lot of companies have been looking to go to corporate finance departments to raise money. Uh, so they've been might have been doing rights issues, whatever. Uh, in an, in normal markets, uh, if if a company takes on, for instance, a rights issue for stock X Y Z, that stock X Y Z would go onto a restricted list within the bank. Um, so that if, uh, so that for instance, the, the, the firm itself, the trading bar, part of the firm probably wouldn't be allowed to price risk in that, in that asset because that could be seen as a conflict of interest. So have all these uh, restricted lists been kept up to date? Have they been input into the system so that um, people, uh, so that systems uh, and have, been, have been able to flag when, a, when an order comes in that there might be conflict of interest, for example? Uh, likewise, corporate actions departments, uh, seen as possibly the slightly unsexy bit of the business, but in fact, they're, they're a key to, um, to trading and making sure that the trading mechanics of a financial institution flow smoothly. Uh, for instance, uh, if we look at the States recently, both Apple and Tesla have both had stock splits. Um, I'm sure institutions will have been all over these sort of things. And if uh, your nightmare would be, for instance, if um, Apple was trading at 1,000 before and is now about to trade at 200, if, the, if, people, if clients had left orders uh, on the market to buy at 1,000 and then the next day the stock had it opened at 200, they're gonna, there's going to be a problem. So they, you need to make sure that all these corporate actions, databases, et cetera, have been kept up to date throughout all this crisis. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the Vodafone example was just one order. Uh, banks are dealing with thousands, multiple thousands of orders across multiple product lines, and they have to ensure best execution for all of them. Uh, and as I've been going through uh, the implications of working from home for a lot of these things uh, must be kept on top of. And I think a lot of controls were possibly loosened slightly when lockdown hit, uh, just to make sure that businesses can, could continue uh, to, uh, to work as seamlessly as possible. Uh, a lot of these controls would have to have been put in, uh, put back in uh, pretty rapidly. And, and I think this, you know, when it first struck, it, it, it was a very strange world we were living in. I think a lot of scrabbling around was going on just to make sure things carried on as usual. Um, but uh, we seem to be in a new normal now. And I would like to think that a lot of those controls would have been reimposed uh, very rapidly. I think there would have been, um, you know, for instance, I, I know when lockdown struck, the FCA were, happy to loosen slightly their rules on recording the light recording of lines but um, these th these things would have been have to be put in place very quickly to make sure that uh, as we're going back to breaks in communication and audit trail um, that uh, recorded lines were adhered to very rapidly uh, once lockdown had hit. Uh, just looking at the back office of, um, on equities just very quickly underneath the hood um, they, most equities settle uh, domestically in their local depositories. So for instance, in the UK, equities settle in Crest. In the US, they settle in something called DTC. Uh, and that would be the, the case for, for the bulk of the equities. If, if not local, as in if you are trading a UK stock but settling it in US dollars, uh, it would settle in Euroclear. And uh, most equities now trade here in Europe and in the States on a T plus two timeframe. I think there's a few exceptions to that. Uh, certainly for new issues, there are exceptions, but I think the bulk of markets in the developed world are now on a, a two-day time frame. And going back to the um, uh, organogram we had earlier uh, with the order flowing through the system, uh, a lot of that will occur on what's called the FIX protocol, which stands for Financial Information Exchange. That is the de facto messaging standard for pre- and post-trade communication. 
uh, and is now used as a sort of straight through processing um, for, for equities and a lot of other uh, financial instruments. But the, the great thing about it, as I was alluding to, is it gives you an audit trail. So there's, there's timestamps all the way along uh, the process of that, of that order flowing through the system. Now I'm just going to move on and look at ETFs, which are very similar to equities, but there are a few wrinkles around the size that make them very interesting product to trade. Um, they trade exactly the same as equities, but as I've mentioned there, the mechanisms are a bit different. They've been a huge success story over the last uh, 20 years or so. I think assets in the ETF world are now well over 7 trillion from um, back more, more like 400 billion back in 2005. So there's been a huge explosion in ETFs, especially in the States. They are uh, they, they're used as, as massive parts of people's portfolio in the US. Uh, they, there has been a decent uptake in Europe, uh, and I, th I know a lot of institutional investors use them. In fact, the retail has been a big driver in the US. Retail hasn't picked up to the degree that people would have liked in, the, in Europe, but I'm sure that will come. Um, ETFs are a sort of hybrid of an open-end and closed-end fund. So what is, why they're attractive to people is that they, they take the, the, uh, the best bits, I suppose, of both worlds in a way. Uh, closed-end funds, for those who don't know, are uh, a fund that goes out and raises, let's say, $100 million. The assets of that are, are then separate from the price of that. So the price of that fund trades on the exchange on a day-by-day, minute-by-minute basis, uh, whereas the assets themselves are traded by the fund managers. So they might raise, let's say, $100 million to go and invest in the emerging markets. Uh, the, the price of the uh, the, the fund itself is determined by buyers and sellers of those units. So let's say they would launch at 100. If lots of, lots of people have interest in buying that, it might trade up to 105, even though the uh, net asset value or the underlying assets are only worth 100. So it would be trading at a premium to the net asset value. Uh, likewise, uh, if uh, there are a lot of sellers of the uh, instrument, it would trade at 95, let's say, at a 5% discount. But the key in all of this is that the, the asset manager himself uh, always has that $100 million that he was given at the beginning to trade. He is not having to sell positions to meet redemptions uh, as, as the price fluctuates around, which is very different from an open-ended fund, which tends to only trade once a day or maybe even once a week, or I suppose you could call a hedge fund an open-ended fund. They only trade once, uh, once a month or maybe even once a quarter. Um, and in that basis, um, as money comes in or leaves, that money is deployed or, re or removed from the market itself. So um, they don't trade at a premium or discount, they trade at their net asset value at all times, but only on a daily basis. And if, as we've seen, for instance, uh, in the Neil Woodford saga, uh, if a lot of people rush the exit at the same time, that can cause redemptions to become so huge that the, the fund is forced to close. Uh, and an ETF is a sort of hybrid of the two. So it trades on markets like any other equity on a day by day, minute by minute, second by second basis. And there is a mechanism which is known as the um, authorized participant mechanism, uh, the, sorry, the redemption creation mechanism run by the authorized participants that allows at the end of each day uh, units of the equity to be swapped for the underlying if, 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 if people require. So therefore, the ETF tracks, uh, doesn't tend to trade, although that, and that's not quite the case because it can do, but in normal market conditions, it won't trade at a big premium or discount to its underlying assets because at the end of the day, there is this mechanism, this redemption creation mechanism that allows a stock to be swapped uh, for the underlying assets, which means that uh, the, the sort of authorized participants and market makers are incentivized to keep the price of the, the ETF as close to the underlying as possible because if there was a big divergence either way, there becomes an, an arbitrage whereby they could uh, buy units of the underlying and sell the, sorry, buy units of the ETF itself and sell units of the underlying if they moved out to a discount and take that discount, that 5% discount, let's say, and that would be pure profit to them because at the end of the day, they could swap one for the other at, at one for one. Uh, why they've been such a huge success story is that they allow uh, hedging of positions and they also allow a big broadening of mandates because they fall under an equity remit. Uh, if you, uh, as a manager, uh, can only invest in equities, you can't invest in futures, let's say, uh, an ETF would allow you to gain access to um, 
underlying commodities, for instance, like gold or oil, uh, although we'll come on to issues with that uh, going forward. Uh, they also allow you to track indices. You might maybe they track a, 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 an oil uh, index or a pharmaceutical index or uh, an ESG type index. Uh, they, they allow and they give a much cheaper way of, be, of people being able to track um, certain themes within the market without having to uh, look at the underlying equities themselves. Uh, and another thing we should mention with that regard to equities uh, is the difference between physical and synthetic ETFs, sorry, not equities. Um, so physical replicates, this is all to do with what the underlying assets uh, of the ETF look like. So a physical, uh, as the name suggested, you would, if you were buying, for instance, an S&P 500 ETF, uh, the underlying of that is all 500 shares of the stock, of the, uh, of the, of the index. Whereas a synthetic, the underlying would just be a swap written by uh, an underlying counterparty. So a synthetic will, send to, will tend to trade much more accurately. There'd be much less slippage versus the underlying. But at the end of the day, because it's synthetic, you are actually taking on counterparty risk uh, when, you, when you participate, when you buy that ETF, because the underlying, uh, the, the underlying product uh, is, is being hedged or, or written by a financial institution. Whereas in a physical, you could swap uh, any any stage that you wanted. You could swap that ETF for the underlying uh, assets and receive, for instance, 500 shares into your account in, in varying sizes compared to the uh, the index composition. Um, the mechanics of ETF trading they trade very similarly to equities. However, um, especially in Europe, liquidity on the book can be quite misleading because a lot of business is transacted off the book by the aforementioned market makers and, and authorized participants. Um, and this has been a bit of an issue because I think a lot of people will look at uh, an ETF in, listed in London, for example, that might track, uh, I don't know, just uh, a pharmaceutical index and look on the book and there'll be a big wide spread. There'll be hardly any shares traded. But actually what people need to understand is that the market makers themselves can make very big prices to institutions based off the fact that the underlying, there's a lot of liquidity in the underlying shares or the underlying futures that that thing is tracking. So you might look at an ETF and be a bit frightened because it looks like if you get into, you know, if you, you, if you have a position in it and then you need to get out a bit fast, it only looks like it trades a thousand shares a day. But actually a lot of that, it might actually trade more like a million shares a day. A lot of this just happens to be priced by market makers and printed on other exchanges. So, um, uh, that's a, this is a problem that they faced in, 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 in Europe. In the States, where they have a consolidated tape, uh, liquidity in the ETFs is, is huge. In fact, a lot bigger than the underlying, uh, the underlying uh, equities or indices that it tra they track, uh, partly because a lot of that volume is consolidated onto, onto one tape. So people look at an ETF, they can see that it trades a lot of uh, volume and, and business. Mm. Uh, ETFs are, are priced on a second by second basis by a lot of the uh, a, lot of, a lot of institutions outside of the banks as well so the banks are obviously very active in the space but there are a lot of specialist financial institutions some of which are listed here such as Optiva, Jane Street, Flow Traders and Susquehanna that are trading uh, a, a lot of these ETFs on a daily basis uh, and they can use big powerful algorithms and computers to price up large size in these things based on what the underlying uh, liquidity of the uh, the underlying liquidity of the underlying instruments is and allows them to price uh, big size uh, up to institutions on, on a daily basis in these names. Um, what tends to happen is that uh, if you're an asset manager and you're a client of one of the large banks, they will tend to uh, put a screen on your uh, on your desktop that would allow you to price up any ETFs within that they track. Uh, by literally clicking a few buttons. So if you uh, looked at a pharmaceutical ETF and you wanted to buy $10 million worth, you'd be able to click on a, a few buttons, uh, say what, say the price and the, the, well, the size you're looking to buy, they would probably price you. They would use something called a request for quote or RFQ model. They would price up uh, what that $10 million uh, worth, maybe a couple of points outside the spread. You could click a button and then you'd have dealt. And then their underlying back book would be, uh, would be, uh, looking to unhedge that position as quickly as they could uh, based off of the underlying securities within it. Um, and this is just a, uh, uh, an ETF trading example that I pulled out that, um, that, that shows that they can be used to do some quite interesting, funky 
funky trades. Um, and this is a way to, you could use an ETF to build a position sort of under the radar. In fact, you could buy a position in a stock without buying a position in a stock in a way. You, what you would do is synthetically get long a position in a stock by, by doing this trade. So um, I'll leave people to sort of read through that as I try to explain it without going into too much detail. But if you had a, an ETF that, tra that tracked um, 10 equally weighted constituents and you wanted to take a position in one of those, you could in fact buy the ETF and short sell the other nine instruments against that, giving you a synthetic um, position in what I've called uh, in security D in this case. So you are therefore long an ETF, short nine uh, components, and then at any time, if you wish, you could uh, go to an authorized participant, swap the ETF for the 10 underlying, uh, nine of those positions would then flatten off and you'd be left uh, with your position in D. Now I've seen this trade done quite a number of times by some quite smart clients as a way of building positions without telegraphing, a bit, going back a bit to what we were talking about information leakage earlier, without telegraphing to the market that they are looking to do this trade. They might be building up a position because they're interested in, uh, in agitating for change at, this, at, this, at the company or whatever it may be. But it's, it's a smart way that allows people to build positions um, uh, sort of slightly under the radar. Uh, uh, and this is one of ETF's downsides, I suppose. So this is a, a chart of USO, which is the big um, oil tracking ETF out in the, out in the US, uh, United States. Uh, looking at that chart below, obviously you can see uh, the ETF and the underlying tracked each other very well, but I'm sure as we all remember, when we had all these, um, this, this big volatility spike and, and incredibly the oil price went negative, um, there were big problems, especially at USO. And part of the reason the oil price has gone negative, people have surmised might have been because of uh, the, the concentrated risk sat within the USO who are forced to be selling their, the front month, front month contracts they own to buy later dated. Anyway, this is showing you the tracking error that can occur in some ETFs. Uh, so there is a slight buyer beware around um, what ETFs can offer because as you can see, since whatever that is, April of uh, this year, there's been a massive divergence. If you were buying USO to get an in in inverted commas oil exposure, uh, you've had nothing like the return you would have done by by owning the future, and and part of the reason for that is that um, they they've there's a role, uh, what's called a role in a future, so that they exist on a monthly or quarterly basis futures, and as they roll, there might be a difference in in price between one contract and the other, and this we got massively magnified at expiry in March, where we can see this this low print. Um, and as the as oil has therefore rallied since, because USO has one had to diversify away from just owning West Texas instrument uh, West Texas to uh, Brent crude as well, and because of the roll uh, issue, they've been paying away a lot of money to to roll the contracts. They haven't take they haven't partaken in anything like the rally that has occurred in the underlying security. So this is a big issue that that, that can occur in ETFs. Um, issues to think about now that we've been working from home uh, and that um, the, uh, the the the, the uh, working from home model could have brought to um, to the ETF world. Obviously, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of these ETFs are priced by uh, these these big algorithms, big computers at these at these individual firms. And if people have been working from home, would they have had access to that? Would they have been remotely able to access these? these uh, the back into the work network to the sort of power that they would need to be able to price these up efficiently. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, another issue to think about with an ETF is um, how much, uh, looking at that chart before really, uh, is there an issue of deviation from a benchmark or it's NAV? Theoretically, they've been designed to um, track NAVs perfectly, but in fact, in market dislocations, and we did see this back in, um, back earlier in this year, uh, there were deviations from the benchmark uh, or the NAV in some emerging market bond funds where the liquidity of the underlying is much less than the liquidity of the, the ETF itself. Now, the ETF world would argue that this is normal markets working well, as in you couldn't have liquidated large positions in these bonds. So the ETF did trade at a slight discount to, to show that, but it meant that there weren't forced mass forced liquidations in the underlying. So in fact, the ETFs acted as a sort of pressure release mechanism 
uh, in the markets. And another issue to think about going back to looking at uh, transaction cost analysis uh, and the time stamping of orders that we looked at earlier, um, if the underlying uh, ETF is quite illiquid uh, or the tape, you know, the tape is only showing 15, 20 trades a day in an ETF when in fact many millions more are occurring off, off that tape, um, it can be harder to measure that transaction, across, transaction cost analysis against that. Uh, and in summary, we need to just sort of think about all the, all the potential breakpoints across this, uh, this organogram, organogram that we showed earlier in the day. Um, and in fact, if, we, if you think about it, there's been a breakpoint uh, possibility at, at, at all of these information exchange points. So as, as orders have flown from, uh, from fund managers through to brokers uh, and people have been working from home, the chance for a break has increased massively across all these uh, across all these um, connection points. Uh, and that is the end of the presentation. Just to say that we uh, have multiple access to other subject matter experts with, other, with, with trading knowledge of other products, some of which are listed here. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much, Damien. Um, that was a very detailed overview of equities and ETFs. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here, so um, let me just um, start off with that first one. How well did traders manage um, the sudden shift to deal from uh, working from home? Um, well, I think, uh, I mean, I th better than people thought, I think it would be the correct answer to that. I think when, you know, I think if this, uh, this pandemic had hit sort of five, ten years ago, I think we would have been in a all sorts of trouble because I think the communications, the communications are, are much more advanced than they were. So in fact, I think banks were themselves surprised that it was a lot more seamless than they thought it might have been. I think banks have invested obviously very heavily in the years over the last 20, 30 years in off-site uh, disaster recovery um, trading floors. Obviously, these were completely nullified by a pandemic. But I, you know, I think the view is that traders have coped a lot better than people would have thought by, by having been forced to go to work from home. I think initially when it struck, I don't know if people remember that they first look at splitting in bank teams into A and B team and having some in, some out, et cetera, et cetera. But when it became clear that if this was going to be more of a crisis than that and everyone was sent home, um, there was an initial scramble to make sure that people connected in on uh, dedicated secure lines to banks. And obviously there are worries around um, security of home networks, etc. But um, I think things coped, people coped a lot better, and the, and the financial institutions were a lot more resilient um, than than people initially thought. So yeah, yeah, I think it was a sort of general thumbs up that yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. better than expected. Um, okay, uh, another question. Um, you mentioned transaction cost analysis in the ETF section. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a bit more on that, please? Um, so yes, TCA or tra transaction cost analysis is just, um, it, it is, it allows, well, I mean, asset managers and or internal departments to track how well an order is, is traded versus the benchmark underlying it. So let's say you're looking to buy the 10 million vote of home we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, if you, if you look to buy that over today and the price fluctuates today between 105 and 108, and at the end of the day, you get a price in your 10 million at 108. Well, that's, you know, you could look at the average weighted, the, the volume weighted average price of, of uh, Vodafone throughout the day, the high, low, et cetera, et cetera. If you have got a fill uh, at 108 versus, and that's the high of the day, you know, that's not great. That, that's, that's appalling. So there's, there's a lot of um, programs now will track what the order should have traded or, or in a perfect world, what the price against v, uh, VWAP or something like that would have been over a day. Uh, and you can then look to see which of your, your brokers are trading uh, as close to that uh, over, over any period of time um, as, as possible. So it allows you a way to almost rank how well the execution of, of brokers is. And the problem uh, sort of I was leading to in the ETF thing is because if you look to Vodafone, for example, it trades millions of shares throughout the day. You can build up an exact, very detailed picture of, of the, the price parameters and the expected price if people had executed well 
uh, versus that. Whereas if you looked at an ETF and it's only traded a thousand shares uh, that you can see on the, on the sort of electronic markets, it's very hard to work out if you've got a inverted commas good or bad price versus that because the number of data points aren't as clear. Now, what you almost need to do in an ETF is look at the liquidity uh, and the, the I suppose you, you can track, in fact, the intraday NAV based of what the underlying assets were doing. And you almost need to compare uh, from a, for a, for a, for a good transactional analysis um, report, you need to compare the, the price um, that you have received versus what the price of the underlying has done rather than maybe what the price of the ETF itself has done, if that, if that sort of makes sense. Mm, mm, very good, thank you. Um, right, we don't seem to have any further questions. So thank you very much uh, for your time and for your expert knowledge there, Damien. Um, as I said, the, the webinar has been recorded and we'll be sending it out um, next week. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks.